We're here today to honor the life of Stuart Milton Hodgson, known to most as Stuart, simply Stuart. Faithful father, husband, last honorary regular member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and friend to many that are present in this room. There are people with whom our lives intersect that are actually larger than life. Stuart was one such individual. I will not at this time list all the honors and distinctions, nor will I attempt to explain all his titles and honorary rank designations. We would be here longer than you can imagine. And, not being perfect, I might miss one. And someone I'm sure would point that out to me. It is safe to say that the breadth of Stuart's service to Queen and country will be amply addressed in the speakers in the remembrances portion of our service. There is no question that we are here to sorrow over our loss, but we are also clearly here to celebrate his life, a life that made a difference. We're here to see new hope that will carry us through the happy and the difficult times and to rejoice that Stuart is at rest. Today our hearts are soaring from our loss, but we're not able to sorrow for Stuart, for we know that his journey is complete, and he is at rest. We come together as family, friends, and the broader community to provide support and strength, and to receive support and strength as well. I'd ask that you rise for the first prayer. O oh God, we come to you today with hearts that are soaring from our loss. We are not able to sorrow for Stuart, for we know that his journey is complete. We come as your creation, asking that you will suit to each one here a blessing and comfort from your mercy. For those of his family, we ask your special blessing, asking that there will continue to be around them those who will show your love and comfort in very tangible ways, even as has been done to this point. Eternal God, we would ask that as we remember Stuart, think of the quality and length of life that he enjoyed, that we will understand the difference that he made. May we draw deep from your strength for these days, even as we seek to do the impossible, to fill and find ways to fill the void that is left by Stuart's life. Respecting all faiths, I ask this in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. If you have not already picked up on it, there's a distinctive theme to the music that's taking place today. You might feel that you've stepped into a time warp and you're back in the era of World War II. And that is done by design. And so at this time, we will in a moment hear the presentation by the Naden Band of Tipperary. And then Chaplain Lieutenant Flanagan Chaplain for HMCS Discovery will take charge of the service, announce the order and participants in the remembrance, the video collage, and then following that, Piper Tim Fanning will lead us in amazing grace. Temporary, please. <laughs>
I'd like to invite the following individuals to come at this time to share remembrances. The Honorable Joyce Murray, MP. The Honorable Susan Anton, MLA. Please uh, come and uh, sit at the front here. Commissioner George Tucaro, Northwest Territories. Former Commissioner John Parker, Northwest Territories. David Cyril, Queen's Council. Commodore Maria Mulkins, Royal Canadian, Royal Canadian Naval Reserve. Jess Ketchum, BC Ferries and BC Transit. Cindy Rosen, Assistant to Judge Hodgson, Citizenship. Rob Wixon, former Northwest Territories government employee. Sarah Marshall, granddaughter. Evan Hodgson, grandson. And Eugene Hodgson, son. I would ask that uh, each individual comes up um, in their order uh, of, the, of the remembrances to be shared, and then when you're uh, finished the remembrances, uh, we'll return to the seats um, at, all together at the same time. I ask uh, Honorable, the, the Honorable Joyce Murray to come at this time. Well, I'm honored to be asked to say a few words uh, here on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish First Nations. Uh, Eugene, Karen, Stuart, Evan, other family members, dignitaries, guests. It's a pleasure to be able to, to speak today. And I'm not a remarkable person, a people person. Someone with great achievements, but a personable sense of humor and a humble perspective on life. Someone who loved humankind and didn't distinguish levels of, of position so if you were a prime minister or a new citizen you were worthwhile in his eyes. Stuart Hodgson, Hodgson was a builder. Canada is a great country admired throughout the world because of the people who helped build our land and he was one of them. He was a man of vision who saw opportunities and needs and who nurtured those around him. So he was a naval officer, labor leader, councillor of the Northwest Territories, and as commissioner appointed by Prime Minister Pearson. And prior to his arrival, the government of the Northwest Territories was ruled by commissioners and civil servants in Ottawa, many of whom had never stepped foot in the territory. So in 1966, after many public hearings, a report recommended that Yellowknife become the capital of the Northwest Territories and that the government offices be moved there. Stewart made that happen, and during his time, he visited every community every year. It became his mission to bring the government north, and as such, he became the first commissioner to live and work there. Stewart brought a fresh perspective in addition to a new location to the territorial government and he was reputed to have once said to the Prime Minister, I don't know anything about government, and Prime Minister Pearson re responded, that's why I'm sending you. <laughs> Stu also understood who he was actually serving as a public servant. And I quote, uh, with the Dene and the Inuit, they were there first, and you've got to listen to what they have to say. Everything wasn't invented in Ottawa. So he was pretty much ahead of his time because we were rediscovering those principles uh, in recent decades. In an interview in October 2000, Stu summed up his time in the North by saying, after I left, I never said anything because I believe I had my day and did the best I could. I made some mistakes, but I think collectively we did the best we could. It certainly wasn't a one-man show. I had a tremendous group of people who helped me out. So according, according the uh, thanks to those around him and small communities in the North will remember him, not just as a commissioner who helped birth a self-governing territory, but as a man who delivered the water, the fire trucks, the roads, and other basic community infrastructure they needed. So Stu had many other careers after that, and he became a citizenship judge at one point, which is where I met him. He was presiding over citizenship ceremonies at the New Westminster City Hall. 
And I remember the time after the 50 or so new citizens were piped in for their, their swearing-in ceremony, Stu explained to the ceremony guests and dignitaries, I always tell the wives and husbands they must walk beside each other because here in Canada, women and men are equal. And by the somewhat cheeky look on his face, I knew that he was imparting that message to we, the dignitaries and guests, as much as he was reminding the new citizens. So he didn't lose an opportunity or miss an opportunity to help move things further in terms of equality and humanity. Stu's distinguished career is humbling, it's inspiring. He was a remarkable human being, a lifelong liberal who remains <coughs> interested in the ups and downs and ins and outs of politics and public policy right to his last years. Uh, and he worked for years to make British Columbia, the North, and Canada a better place for all. We were privileged to know him and to have him serve us as Canadians. Family, friends, honored guests, it's a privilege and honor to be here today. My name is Suzanne Anton. I'm the MLA for Vancouver Fraser View, the Attorney General and the Justice Minister for British Columbia. And we are here on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. On behalf of the province of British Columbia and Premier Christy Clark, I offer my deepest condolences <coughs> on the passing of a true Canadian pioneer. It's fitting we're gathered here today at HMCS Discovery, and I see many naval people here to honor Stuart Hodgson. It was here where the foundation for a lifetime of service was laid for Stuart Hodgson. This is where he joined the Royal Canadian Navy Reserves during the Second World War, <coughs> serving on a frigate on the deadly and frigid Murmansk run to the Soviet Union. There must have been something in that fighting Arctic air, because once it got into his soul, it never left. And I think it's here with us today. <coughs> After the war, Stuart had a career with the Vancouver Labor Council and the BC Federation of Labor. But I think it's probably his work in the North which became his biggest, his greatest legacy in which he will be never forgotten for that work. He went on to serve the Northwest Territories first as Deputy Commissioner and then as Commissioner for a dozen years, taking his family there. As Commissioner, he earned the name Yumungmak, or Muscox, by the Inuit people for his strength, perseverance, and determination. He was a true champion for the North, and his leadership, passion, and vision helped build a more sustainable, independent region. And as we heard, he visited every community every year. He served every community in the Northwest Territories. He returned to British Columbia and took on two challenges, and I think there's still challenges today, BC Ferries and BC Transit. And uh, I can imagine that those were both interesting positions, and on behalf of the province, I do thank him now for that service to the province. Stuart was the epitome of what hard work could accomplish, from toiling in the plywood mills as a teenager during the Great Depression, to overseeing a region half the size of the United States. I'm sure, somewhere, he's sharing a few laughs with his classmates from John Oliver Secondary, who voted him least likely to succeed. <laughs> In the 91 years that we had him, Stuart held many roles, seaman, laborer, union leader, and devoted public servant. And more importantly, he was a friend, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a proud son of British Columbia. When we reach the end of our lives, success, of course, is not determined by wealth nor followers on social media, but by our accomplishments. And when you're in public life, you do like to hope that you have a history of accomplishment. Well, in Stuart Hodgson's case, there is no doubt. He has a remarkable history of accomplishment, making his province and his country a better place by his service. He was recognized in his life with numerous awards and honors. He will be remembered at his death and for men for forever in Canada, for the history, for the legacy that he left to the Northwest Territories and indeed to the whole of our country, for the achievements that he made in building Canada. He will be missed, he will be remembered. Thank you.
Good afternoon, family, friends, invited guests. My name is George Tuckeroo. I'm the Commissioner of the Northwest Territories. And I'm deeply saddened the loss of a great northern man, a man who was there in his time. I'm also honored to be here to be with former Commissioner of the Northwest Territories, John H. Parker, who sits right beside me, and a man who really knows Stuart Hodgson. Served with him for many, many years, and, and Commissioner Parker was, uh, was there for 10 years after uh, Stu had left. I also would like to acknowledge the member of the Legislative Assembly, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly for the uh, Northwest Territories, who is here, Jackson, the Honorable Jackson Lafferty is also here to uh, represent the North as well. Uh, our regrets uh, come from the uh, current Premier of the Northwest Territories, who was called away on other duty, who could not be here today. And on behalf of all of the members of the Legislative Assembly of the 18th Legislative Assembly. Now back to Stuart Hodgson. He came to Yellowknife, as you heard, back in 1967. A giant of a man at that time. Landed with his own airplane, you know, a couple of airplanes with the bureaucrats who came north to start the government of the Northwest Territories back in 1967. I wasn't there at the time. I didn't get there until 1970. Just in time to watch him really celebrate the first Arctic Winter Games, of which he was a founder and builder of the sporting, sporting event that happens every two years in the circumpolar world. And this year, those Arctic Winter Games are happening in Greenland, and Nunavut. So uh, uh, I just wanted to wanted to mention that because he was deeply, deeply proud of the fact that uh, he was able. And many times he told me the story as a I was a broadcaster before I became commissioner, and I I used to go and interview him. And those were my greatest times to be able to go and see that nice big fancy office up on the sixth floor of the Arthur Lang Building in Yellowknife, and uh, how he welcomed me to 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 just. Be, be at home in his office. And I always marveled at the sight of, of, of Yellowknife from that sixth floor of, of that building. And, and we would talk about the Arctic Winter Games and he would talk, talk so so proudly of uh, his time with Governor Hickel from Alaska and Commissioner Smith from the Yukon and, and they getting together and saying, you know, we, we've been competing with the athletes down south and they've been <coughs> actually really beating us severely. <laughs> I know, you know, you only can get so much experience at losing. And then there has to be a time where we have to be seen as winners as well. So I think uh, back, in, uh, as he thought, in the forefront, you know, uh, and, and little did he know that to this day those games are still as big and, and, and as beautiful as ever and have uh, produced some wonderful athletes that have since gone on to the national stage. So. Uh, as a builder of sport, he's done very, very well. Back then, not only did he have the power, because he was known as the boss, he was the government when he came, came to the north and, and, and when he traveled everywhere. Uh, as, as commissioner today, I mean, I'm, I'm much more of a ceremonial role. All the power has been devolved to the, um, to the people of the Northwest Territories. And so I'm... Uh, not really seen in the same light as, as Commissioner Hodgson, but, but you know, it took someone like Mr. Hodgson to come there and, you know, to, to, to bring government to the people. You know, I speak on behalf of people who had Aboriginal languages as their first and only language. I speak of, of people who actually didn't even have names. They only had little identification numbers. And he changed all of that. Gave them back their names, their Inuit names, their, their Dene names and all of those things, so it's, it's much bigger than, 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 than we, we, we would imagine. And you know, that was just a small part of his life because he came from Vancouver in British Columbia, uh, working in the, in the Union and uh, working as a government, and then came back again and, and was Mr. Transportation for British Columbia for a while as well. So 
He's done many, many wonderful things, and I could probably stay here for a long, long time, but we have many speakers, and I won't take too much more of your time, other than to say that we're in the North. I come as a representative to, to say thank you to a man who has done so much and, uh, and has left such an indelible mark that we will remember for a long, long time and will remain in the history books. Um, Stuart Milton Hodgson has lived a full life and over his last visit, you know, I'll always remember taking him to the house where the children grew, grew up and where he spent his time with his loving wife, Pearl. <coughs> and the brief moment that I spent with him where he had tears in his eyes and he's just quiet and I just sat there with him. I never said a word, just let him go through it. Then he looked at me and said, I can go now. And that was a, you know, that was a very, very important moment that, that I, I wanted to pass along with you. That, you know, he had great deep respect for, for women and he talked about it uh, many, many times. And they're, they're the rulers of the world, we used to say. And, uh, you know, as, as, as current commissioner of the Northwest Territories on behalf of all Northerners, I offer my condolences once again to the Hodgson family, Jean, and Karen, Lynn, and grandchildren, and great grandchildren. Um, as Northerners, you know that we're always here to lend a helping hand to welcome you back to the Northwest Territories when you decide to come back and visit again, you can do. Rest in peace, Mr. Hodgson. Rest in peace, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Masicho. Kwanani. Kwana. Family members, ladies and gentlemen, and especially the uh, current commissioner, George Tucker. <clears throat> Stu Hodgson was a big man with big visions <coughs> and the energy and ability to carry them out, which he did. <clears throat> he was a friend, a compatriot, and a leader. Arthur Lang, then Minister of Northern Affairs and National Resources, appointed him to the Territorial Council as a member, briefly, then as Deputy Commissioner, then, in 1967, he appointed Stu as Commissioner of the Northwest Territories and me as Deputy Commissioner. On September 18, 1967, we moved the tiny Territorial Administration from Ottawa to Yellowknife in two chartered aircraft, which George mentioned, but it was a DC-7 and a DC-4. We stopped en route for fuel at Churchill, then the Territorial Administration Center for the Kiwaitan, and Stu immediately commenced to engage Northern people by making a speech to all assembled staff. Upon arrival in Yellowknife and moving quickly to recruit additional staff, Stu commenced traveling throughout the Northwest Territories. He saw the importance for him to acquaint himself with the huge area, and even more important, to become known to the people in all communities. This was one of his greatest strengths. He very quickly became well-liked and admired. He worked effectively with the Territorial Council and promoted its development as the legislative body of the Northwest Territories. During this time, Stu managed a few end runs around the Ottawa bureaucracy. There were many humorous occasions throughout his time. One that I recall happened <clears throat> when there was a new person on duty at the main door of our office building. When Stu was leaving after normal business hours, the officer stopped him and said, you have to sign up. Stu said, no, I don't. I'm the commissioner. The officer said, no, I'm the commissioner. And you have to sign up. <laughs> recognized the importance of developing 
a broad Canadian interest in the Northwest Territories and achieved this through the 1970 visits of the Queen and members of the royal family, followed by the Prime Minister, federal ministers, and business leaders. After 12 years of devoted service to the Northwest Territories, Stu recognized that he could move on to other challenges. He knew that elected members of the territorial legislature were ready to play a larger role, as exemplified by David Searle, who was Speaker of the Assembly, and who will talk to you next about Stu. Stuart Hodgson was a powerful force in the, in the development of government in the North, and his leadership shaped events in the ensuing years. He is remembered to this day with great affection <laughs> and respect. Thank you very much. Pardon me. I must compose myself. Distinguished guests, and especially family, Stuart Milton Hudson, the OC, was a colossal in the North. His term as commissioner from 1967 to 79, <laughs> matched my term exactly in the NWT legislature. I was very privileged to be elected <coughs> and re-elected three times, and then elected in the last term by my colleagues as the first elected speaker So it is through that lens that I will remember him. We work closely together in the interest of the people of the NWT and of Canada. And we became good friends. I'm sorry, a friendship that lasted long after we both left the North. I want to share with you some of the more humorous events of those years. So I should be able to get through this very easily. <laughs> His marathon meetings in the communities where the whole community would turn out were legendary. The meetings went on until every last question was answered, usually well past midnight. People would leave the meeting and go home for supper and have a nap. <laughs> then return. Stuart would still be there answering questions on his feet. In one such meeting, a request was made for a fire truck. Stuart merely directed that one designated for another community be redirected to this one. And he would always introduce the MLAs in attendance and expect us to patiently sit on the stage behind him. I remember waiting for a comfort break, which never came. <laughs> so we would cross our legs and uncross our legs and then finally sneak off the stage and uh, find the washer. After I was elected speaker in 1975, while he was engaged in his commissioner's address, which was the equivalent of the speech from the throne, I passed him a note. In one fluid motion, he turned around, looked down, turned back, and continued, not missing a beat. The note said, your fly is open. <laughs> I was so unhappy that he hadn't stumbled and fallen. It looked like he was looking for a uh, a page from his speech, you know. He did it so beautifully. Our greatest scheme was hatched by our, I mean he and mine, 
was hatched as a result of a visit to Beachy Island with Peter Lougheed, then Premier of Alberta, where we observed the graves of Franklin's men as well as a Royal Navy cache of artifacts, including a polar bear feeding on bully beef tins. Eugene, you were there and you handled the rifle, I recall. Fortunately, we didn't have to use it because the bear, as soon as he finished this huge putrid, you can imagine, frozen and thawed over the years, uh, bully beef tin, he looked at us as much to say, I don't need you guys. And he walked out, dove into the water, swam up to an iceberg, and the last we saw of him, he was having his afternoon nap. And we heard these great Jesus snoring sounds coming from him. So uh, we discussed the need for legislation protecting these artifacts from re removal from the Northwest Territories, as so many of them had been. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Glenbow Foundation. You will see many Northern artifacts there. But we quickly realized that we lacked a facility to, st to store and display such items. So we resolved then and there, standing on Beachy Island, to build a museum using funds. This is the first time I've publicly admitted to this uh, scam. <laughs> using funds voted for other purposes. With the demands for schools and health care facilities, it is never the right time to build a museum. As I was chairman of the Standing Committee in Finance, and he was commissioner, we felt that we could get away with it, and we did. But there were difficulties when Diane found out what we were doing. But Stuart had enlisted the support of Her Majesty the Queen. He had her private number. And so one day he just called her up and she answered and said, put my good commissioner on. And he said, uh, Your Majesty, do you think you would mind terribly if we named the new museum the Prince of Wales Heritage uh, Museum? And she said, I would be delighted. No, she said, we would be delighted. And uh, so when the department found out about what we were doing, Stuart said, well, if any one of you would like to call the Queen and tell her the museum is off, <laughs> here's her number. So that made us bulletproof, as no one in Diane wanted to call her and tell her that the museum would not be built. And there are many other side stories flowing from this escapade. I notice Victor Irving is here. He could tell you a bunch, because uh, just uh, to add, because he's here, and you may want to talk to him afterwards to determine the full truth. But uh, Stuart decided to have a life-size picture of the Prince of Wales done, painted with a horse, a life-size horse. So you can imagine the size of this painting. Well, the artist didn't get it done on time for the opening. So Stuart absolutely insisted that the painting be there, finished or not. So he sent Victor down to uh, bring it back. And Victor can tell you how difficult that was because the painting was wet. So he had to hang it in a box so that it wouldn't touch the sides. And then he had the box stand upright and was strapped on a trailer. And he trailed her, trailered it all the way from someplace in America to the Northwest Territories. And then you can imagine getting this box into the, into the building and to cut out the uh, door frames. And finally, 
And finally, the day came when the Prince of Wales arrived. And here we had this painting hung on the wall that was unfinished. And uh, so Stuart, uh, with his usual uh, flamboyant gestures, he, he had a button where he sat. And uh, when he pressed the button, the uh, curtains would draw it and show this painting. And then if he pressed it again, the curtains would close. <laughs> and I remember ever so briefly seeing this painting. And the Prince of Wales was standing there. His hand was unfinished. And the reins of the horse were unfinished. And so was the bridle and the other bits and pieces of the horse. So then Victor had to return the painting uh, all the way to the States so that it would be finished. So that was a, a, a side event of this uh, same escapade of building the museum at Victor. I know you're here today and I'm sure you'll agree with me that this was one of your more difficult assignments. Thank you very much, all of you, for being patient, but this is the lighter side of Stuart Hodgson that I knew. Thank you. Ministers, <coughs> commissioners, dear family, friends, colleagues, and shipmates of Stuart Hodgson, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of the Royal Canadian Navy as we gather here to celebrate the extraordinary life and accomplishments of Stuart Hodgson. I have been asked to speak about Mr. Hodgson's naval wartime experience, which began right here as a young adult in Her Majesty's Canadian ship Discovery. Discovery, for those of you who don't know, is one of 24 Naval Reserve divisions across Canada. It traces its history to the creation of the number two Vancouver Company of the then Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve out of the Royal Vancouver Yacht Club, where a small group of members who had served there were demobilized in the aftermath of the First World War. In 1941, this number two company was commissioned as HMCS Discovery, and in 1944 moved here to Edmonds Island. At the beginning of the Second World War, the Royal Canadian Navy was only a mere 3,900 personnel, but would surge to over 90,000 by war's end, and Discovery would play an important part in that growth, enrolling here over 8,000 officers, ratings, and wrens, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. At the end of the war, Discovery became the discharge center for the whole of the British Columbia mainland, and roughly the same number of men and women were discharged through this facility. Stuart Hodgson was one of those recruited and discharged here. According to his memoirs, the shelling of Estevan Point by a Japanese submarine was one catalyst leading to Stuart's decision to join the Volunteer Reserve, despite the misgivings of his father. 17 years old at the time, he later wrote that he felt it was the right thing to do. It also, he said, set the course for the rest of his life in public service, as you heard as it undoubtedly did for 90,000 other young Canadian men and women who joined the Navy to serve this great country, and who are undoubtedly looking for a little adventure as well. He reported for duty at Discovery as an anti-aircraft gunner in July of 1942, where he was issued his kit and his hammock. His initial training was conducted here at Stanley Park. He then boarded the train for the long journey to Halifax, which was his first time beyond the mountains. In January of 1944, he would end up in Londonderry Island where he joined his ship, the River Class Frigate HMCS Mono, which served on convoy escort duties in the North Atlantic through most of the war. <coughs> Mono participated in the D-Day landings and, as you heard, was part of the convoy escort duties of the treacherous Murmansk run, during which, while escorting a convoy near Scotland, she located and sank a German submarine. I think I would be remiss if I did not also mention as an anti-aircraft gunner, he also shot down a Junkers 88. After a few more assignments following the victory in Europe, which included escorting 14 U surrendered U-boats into Scotland, Mono was paid off and her crew returned to Canada. After exactly three years of wartime service, the now 20-year-old Petty Officer Hodgson returned here to HMCS Discovery and was discharged on July 2nd, 1945. 
The post-war period saw Discovery continue its Naval Reserve training role, which would be transformed many times between then and now, with the unchanging mission of trans training citizen sailors for naval operations. And as an aside, Discovery has been successful in carrying on the tradition of sailors like Stuart Hodgson. Over the years, Vancouver Reserve sailors have sail deployed everywhere from Korea uh, to landlocked Afghanistan on your behalf. In fact, the Hodgson family itself continues to serve the Royal Canadian Navy in several ways. As you know, Stuart Hodgson's son, Eugene, is a prominent member of the Friends of HMCS Vancouver Committee, and his grandson, Abel Seaman Evan Hodgson, has been a member of HMCS Discovery here as a naval communicator since 2014. We hear and understand a great deal about the cost of war, and I will not presume to know what particular motivation Stuart Hodgson may have taken from his own personal experience. But for so many, having witnessed in conflict both the depths and frankly the peaks as well of the human condition, inspired them to return to Canada determined to become nation builders. Having had their own personal horizons broadened, perspectives forever altered in that crucible, and in many cases with their wounds visible or otherwise, they resolutely set to work and built a large part of the society and country that we know today. In his life after the war, Stuart Hodgson certainly embodied the fullest achievement of that spirit and drive. And so on behalf of the Royal Canadian Navy, and in my own capacity as the commander of today's Naval Reserve, I thank Stuart Hodgson for his service and sacrifice. We are very proud that this great Canadian was formed partly within our own storied institution and I know our sailors today would have been honored to call him shipmate. On behalf of the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, Vice Admiral Norman, please accept our deepest condolences for the loss of your father, grandfather, colleague, and friend, Stuart Milton Hodgson. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jess Ketchum, and I'd first like to uh, thank the family for providing me with this uh, real honor to uh, help celebrate uh, Stuart's life, uh, a life uh, truly worth celebrating. <laughs> um, I like to think that I had a hand in bringing Stu and Pearl and the family back to, uh, to BC. It was uh, 1981 and I was assistant to uh, Alex Fraser, who was the Minister of Transportation and Highways, the minister responsible for BC ferries at the time. Uh, my minister liked to build roads and bridges but he really, well, ferries just were not his cup of tea. And uh, at the time, there were some tremendous challenges with BC ferries around labor issues and others, and the traveling public liked to complain about everything from the schedules to the scrambled eggs. And uh, Alex really wasn't very keen on dealing with any of that. So I got to deal more with BC ferries than I ever thought possible. Convinced uh, that there was a need to uh, make some significant changes, um, I came up with the uh, concept that the minister should not be the chair of the board of directors of BC Ferries, and that we should recruit a, a full-time <coughs> hire, a full-time chairman of the board. And uh, that idea was was accepted, and uh, we set about doing a search. Uh, we interviewed a number of people, a very very uh, uh, capable people, but uh, not just the right person. And the recruiters one day said, we want you to come over to Vancouver, to fly over to Vancouver, Victoria, and meet another candidate. And I thought, well, the candidate can't want the job very much since I'm flying to meet him rather than him coming over to Victoria. But um, uh, desperate to try to find someone to do the job, uh, flew over to Vancouver, and the, the recruiters, uh, the, head, the lead recruiter was a friend of mine. He said, look, he said, this is a very unique candidate. And I'm not going to tell you anything about the candidate, you're just going to have to trust me and, uh, and uh, come over to Vancouver and, and uh, meet him there. So uh, flew over to the airport, we were in a hotel, I was in one room and he was in another. Um, it, was, it was one of the most interesting meetings of my life, I have to tell you that. Um, the reason that they didn't tell me uh, much about uh, the candidate, Stu Hodgson, prior to, to him introducing himself to me, was that uh, that was a very good strategy on their part. Uh, they knew that I'd have a panic attack once I realized that I was going to have to sell 
someone to the Bill Bennett government who was a founder of the NDP in British Columbia, who was a very engaged leader in the labor movement, and a horror of horrors, he was a personal friend of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's. <laughs> and you have to appreciate that in 1981, this was not, this was not a job that I was looking forward to doing. Anyway, um, Stuart walked through the door and immediately I thought, this is someone who's older than I thought we probably should be recruiting. He was a little rumpled and then I thought after time I realized that was like a, a uniformist do. And he sat down in front of me in 10 minutes I thought he could walk on water. It was just one of the most amazing <laughs> transformations that I've gone through in my life where this guy just convinced me in a matter of moments that there was no one else for the job. So Stu was hired uh, and the first thing he did is he went on every single route uh, that BC Ferries operated on. He toured the ships from from the uh, engine rooms, the galley, to the bridge. He met just every employee that he could, he could encounter, and he met he met uh, the passengers. Boy, could he ever communicate with passengers. He actually became a champion for the scrambled eggs, which I just could never figure out. He did. But the passengers and the crew found that finally there was somebody they could sit down to, they could talk to, and he really, really listened. I think that was such a big part of of what Stuart did so so well. But I want to talk a bit about some of the personal experiences that I had that uh, I think point out the, the man that Stuart Hodgson really, Hodgson really was. One day he walked into my office early, very early on in his time at BC Ferries, and my office was in the Parliament Building, and he came in and he handed me a plastic envelope. He said, here, I think you'll find this interesting. It was two royal commands to the wedding of Charles and Diana. One for him and one for Pearl. There were a total of seven in all of Canada. Well, of course, I just thought, obviously, they would go. And when I let him know that I thought that was obvious, he said, well, he said, uh, uh, we just received them and we haven't made up our mind that we're going to go or not. How can that be? <laughs> so anyway, Stuart left. And I thought, you know what? I didn't know Stuart's situation very well at the time. I thought, maybe it's a question of finances big trip, a lot of money. So I phoned the uh, CEO of a certain airline and uh, without any convincing whatsoever, they offered to sponsor the, the trip for both uh, Stuart and Pearl. And uh, so I could hardly wait to tell Stu the news. He came in one day to the office. I explained this to him, thinking that I was, I'd done a really good thing and you wouldn't have believed his response. He said, don't you know that I've just started a really important job that's very difficult and I have to be totally focused on that? I think I did. <laughs> so, Stuart uh, uh, decided that uh, uh, they weren't going to go on, the, uh, on that particular trip and, and he topped that conversation off by, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, he said, anyway, we're going to go and visit them when they're not so busy. <laughs> And as most of you know here in the room, he meant that. Well, before LinkedIn, Facebook, smartphones, Stu was the consummate uh, networker. He could call anyone. One day we were discussing the lack of uh, federal financial support for BC ferries, and, and I muttered something about, uh, wouldn't it be great to know the Prime Minister's position, Prime Minister Trudeau, and, and Stuart said, well, why don't we call him? Once again, amazed. I said, Stuart, you know, it'll take me days to get the approval for you to make that call. But I'm going to go to the washroom now. And then I'm going to get us a coffee. And I should be about 10 minutes. And I came back into the office in 10 minutes, and Stu said, uh, he's going to call me tonight. And he did. I'll never forget that. A few days ago, I was having a coffee with uh, my friend uh, Mike O'Connor, who worked uh, with me when I was in government, but also went on to be president of BC Transit when Stu was the chair of BC Transit. Mike told me that at one meeting, Stu had to take a call. Within a few minutes, they realized that he was, he was speaking to a Buckingham Palace. Uh, never ceased to amaze. Stu served his province, this province, extremely well on both the BC ferries and BC, BC Transit, and was truly an agent of change. He did some marvelous things, but you know, a lot of it goes back to his ability to listen and uh, his ability to, to really concentrate on what people were, were suggesting and asking. 
This was a guy that was responsible for one of the largest and most successful ferry systems in the world, but also a very complicated uh, transit system, and for a time he ran both of them. He created the first government, or certainly had a big hand in creating the first government in the Northwest Territories. He solved major international disputes with the IJC. This was a guy who came back from his war in the North Atlantic and went to work in the plywood mills here on the coast. So what was, his, what was the key to his success in his life? I thought about, excuse me, I thought about that a lot uh, recently. And I know one contributing factor. He genuinely liked people, all people. He was generally, genuinely interested in what you were telling him, what you were saying, and above all else, he was kind and considerate. Let me provide a couple of examples. That royal wedding, while Stu fretted very much over what he would give the royal, what he and Pearl would give to the royal couple for a wedding gift. What do you give for a wedding gift? Uh, finally, he told me that uh, Charles' favorite uncle, Lord Mountbatten, had given him a regimental flag, of his regimental flag in World War II. Uh, it meant a lot to Mountbatten. Of course, how, we, how Stu got the flag is a whole different story. But Stu and Pearl had decided that they were going to re-gift that flag to Philip and or Charles and Diana. A gift that would really mean something on a very personal level uh, to a future king. Pretty amazing. On a more personal basis, when I, uh, when I left government to go to work for Expo 86 in Vancouver, um, Stu hosted a dinner uh, for me here in the city and presented me with a ship's bell mounted on a plaque thanking me for my contributions, my contributions to BC Ferries. I was no longer uh, anyone that uh, he had to work with or put up with uh, in government, uh, but he just did it. Just did it. That was the way that Stu operated. One last example, Stu knew that I collected autographed books. He owned a, a small book that had been written by Pierre Elliott Trudeau while in the university, and it was autographed. One day, Stu came into my office and presented me with, with that book. He gifted it to, uh, to me. Just, he knew that I would be genuinely uh, appreciative of that and, uh, and just did it. I would wager here that uh, everyone here today has similar stories of our friend Stu Hodgson. He was larger than life. He lived several very full lives. He experienced so much, he contributed even more to so many. And there is no possible way that I will forget Stu. Uh, it's truly a white, a light worth celebrating. Thank you very much. Family, friends, distinguished guests, and fellow Citizenship Court staff. I felt deeply honored when asked by Eugene and Karen to speak about my years working at the Citizenship Court with Judge Stuart Hodgson, which was what we always called him, or Judge Stuart. As we've heard, Judge Stuart was truly one of a kind and had so many positive qualities. But what I was most impressed with was his amazing ability to connect with people at the emotional level regardless of their age, ethnic group, or social status. This was an invaluable gift. As a citizenship judge, he had to both judge and inspire people of varied backgrounds from countries all over the world. Despite the many prestigious positions we've heard about that he had held before coming to our office, he never acted self-important, nor had to appear that he knew everything. He treated the citizenship staff with respect and often sought out our opinion on cases. We had a wonderful, wonderful working relationship with him, and I see members of our staff here today coming out to honor him. He was so practical, smart, and genuine. And over the years, we developed a friendship both inside and outside the office. The biggest responsibility of a citizenship judge was deciding whether the candidate qualified to become a Canadian citizen. While he always displayed kindness and fairness when examining the candidates, 
He could also be strict and not approve them if he felt they did not meet the requirements. He really loved and cared Canon, about Canada. And he did not wish to dilute the quality of who was becoming a Canadian citizen of this great country. We did many citizenship ceremonies together, both at the citizenship court and in the community, such as at Canada Place and in schools. In his speech to the new Canadians, he did not bore them with a generic pep talk or spout out statistics, but spoke from the heart and shared his personal stories. He spoke about being a son of poor immigrants that had fled their country because of religious persecution, that he had worked hard since he was a young child for little, very little pay, and the prestigious positions we've heard about today he had eventually had achieved were as a result of that hard work and perseverance. He held the audience captive. They were sitting at the edge of their seats, taking it all in. And they, they felt his genuineness, and that he had been there, and he was somebody who really understood them. He did not tell these stories to boast, but to inspire and convey a message of hope to these people. That if you're honest and hardworking, there are no limits to what this great country can uh, bestow upon you. He also recognized the challenges Canada was facing. There were people immigrating here from all over the world that had different political, religious, and social backgrounds. He wanted to stress to them that despite our differences, what we do have in common was our value systems and Canadian laws, and they must be respected and obeyed. As mentioned, also at each ceremony, he emphasized gender equality and extolled the contributions that women had made to society by their hard work and sacrifice. He wanted to make sure that despite what the case was in your former country of origin, that in Canada, we treat women with respect and we will not tolerate anything less. I see some nodding. So we've heard that. Judge Stewart had the wonderful combination of not only adding class to this momentous occasion, but a very warm human touch. When handing out the citizenship certificates at a ceremony, he would pleasantly surprise the youngsters with a high five or a gift of candy or a Canadian flag. He was always willing and eager to go out to the schools to teach the rights and responsibilities of Canadian citizenship and speak about our colorful history. He particularly loved telling stories about his time in the Northwest Territories. The children listened in awe, and no wonder, as they were hearing history from the man who had lived it. He had life wisdom, and we learned so much from him. In honor of Judge Hodgson's love of storytelling, and I'm sure most of you have had the pleasure of hearing many of his stories, I would like to tell you this true story you may not have heard. And it's true. A good friend of mine, Shale Smith, was out for his uh, weekly Saturday morning walk when he encountered a friendly elderly gentleman. They struck up a conversation and Shale asked the man, what type of work did you used to do? The man answered nonchalantly, I was the commissioner of the Northwest Territories. Really, Shale said. <laughs> the, elder, the elderly man continued, uh, after that I was chair of BC Ferries and BC Transit and then a judge. I would have been governor general of the of Canada, but my wife Pearl didn't let me. <laughs> my friend Shale just smiled, nodded politely. When he returned home, he said to his wife Lottie, shaking his head, well, the man I met out when walking today really takes the prize. This guy was so delusional that he thought he had not only been the commissioner of the Northwest Territories, but the chair of BC Ferries, 
and of BC Transit, and a judge. And not only that, but he even turned down the position of Governor General when he personally was asked by the Prime Minister. To his surprise, his wife Lottie exclaimed, that man wasn't delusional. That was Cindy's good friend, Judge Stuart Hodgson. Everything he said about himself was true. Yes, the life Stuart Hodgson led was truly unbelievable. Stuart was the embodiment of the Yiddish word a mensch, which is the highest compliment one can pay a person. It's hard to translate the word from Yiddish, but generally a real mensch is defined as a responsible person of integrity, honor, and dignity, who has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. A person who, contribu who contributed greatly to make his family and community and country better. Someone to admire and emulate. Stuart Hodgson was very much such a person, and we are truly blessed to have had him in our lives. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends and family and honored guests. My name is Rob Wixon. Uh, I'm not anybody special. I was an employee of the government of the Northwest Territories, but I'm gonna go back to the beginning of my story. It was in 1967, New Year's Eve, that my father dragged his young family up to the Northwest Territories. I was 15 years old at the time. And uh, John Parker, you may remember, the next morning my dad was knocking at your door to try and get the keys to his house because the motel was inadequate. Um, but I want to talk about how Mr. Hodge really influenced my life. <coughs> a year and a half later, my parents left town. And I tell everybody they abandoned me, but actually I chose to stay. And I chose to stay because the North was interesting. There was something about it that was different from everything else I'd done in my life that far. So I got a job with the government of the Northwest Territories, and I worked in the mailroom. And guess who I met almost every day? As he walked by the mailroom, he'd stop and see if there was any mail for him. And he'd chat with us. And it was always just like he was another guy. It was never anybody, we didn't have to do anything special. But we did call him Mr. Hodgson, and we called him Sir. Uh, but he was always very, very congenial with us. He'd come down, bring a parcel down and say, can you mail this for me? And that was always a good working relationship. And as the time went on, I got promoted. And at one point, I had all the keys to the buildings for the government of Northwest Territories in my charge. And I got a phone call from his office one day. Mr. Hodge has been locked out of his office. Can you bring your keys? So I went running upstairs, and none of the keys worked. I said, never mind. I whipped out my wallet, took my charge card, and I broke into his office. <laughs> well, from that point on, anytime he needed to get in anywhere in that building, he would call me, and we would break in, or we would do whatever is necessary. <laughs> so, through the years, I managed to, I was very lucky, and I got to work for the legislature. When it became a legislature, it was a council before that, and I got to observe a man and how he chaired a meeting. Well, to this day, uh, I think those skills are where I got where I got those skills is from watching him do that. Uh, I've been chair of the Chamber of Commerce. I've been chair of my community association, and I do a good job of it because I've learned those skills at a tender age in the Northwest Territories. It's fast, but I also remember one time uh, Mr. Hodgson came and said, "Bobby, I need your help." He always called me Bobby, and so he dragged me out and he says, I need to change the flags on top of the building because the DPW will take too long. I said, okay. So up we went to the sixth floor of the land building, climbed out the roof, and this is how much I trusted the man because he grabbed onto my belt and I leaned over the side of this building and changed these three flags. <laughs> That's trust. And I never hesitated on that. But on the way up to the roof that day, he told me two things that I hold dear and I tell everybody I learned them from him. The first thing he said to me, he says, don't ever be afraid to make a decision. And when you think about that, that's a lot of implications there. You know, what does it take to make a decision? Well, who's responsible? All those things that people become afraid of. He told me not to be afraid of doing that. And I am not. 
I run my own businesses, and that's the way I behave. And the second thing he told me, which I still hold dear today, is you don't have to know everything, you just have to know who to hire. Those things have gone on in my life forever. I now own two businesses. I've been Chamber of Commerce presidents and, and on and on. But most important, even after I left the Northwest Territories when he was chair of BC Ferries, I could phone him up and sit down with him and chat with him about the North and you, use him for research for my papers at university. He was always open, always very helpful. Mr. Hodgson, I thank you. My grandfather, my geek, meant so much to all of us grandchildren. My brother Travis says he remembers my grandfather Gee as an honorable and noble man. He was extremely hardworking and had accomplished a lot in his lifetime. The last memory he has of him was introducing him to his lovely wife Shauna, his great grandson Riley, and his new great granddaughter Chloe, who was only a month old at the time. <laughs> he glowed with pride when he while meeting them. The gentleman that he was, with his formal introduction, he made Shauna blush when he kissed the back of her hand. He then led, led them through his home, sharing stories and his adventures, and showing them all of his novelties and pictures. It was a very wonderful afternoon. When I sat down to write this, my mind went blank. My grandfather means so much to me. So many feelings and memories. But how do, they, how do I sum up the most important person in my life? My grandfather was kind and caring. He was generous and selfless. He was everything. something he did with all of his grandchildren. When I was in his arms, I felt like I was on top of the world. For my grade 12 write-up in the yearbook, they asked us who our hero was. I proudly wrote my grandfather. I lived with my grandparents when I went to university. Whenever I had friends over, he always told them, just call me Keith. Like they were his own grandchildren. After my aunt passed, and it was when it was just Eve and I, every night when I'd make him dinner, he'd say, You're a good cook. You got that from your man. And his prideful smile was stretched from ear to ear. I always imagined that when I got married, my grandfather would be the one to walk him down the aisle. And I've never imagined the world without my grandfather. Although he's gone, he'll forever be in my heart. I love you, Kate. Well, that's not an easy thing to follow, I can tell you. Choice of Marines, Suzanne, Anton, Commissioner Tuck Group. George, I worked with you in uh, CBC and the LNA. I remember George would always take me doing the news, and I'd get to about the 10th minute, and he'd, he'd make me laugh, and I'd stop, and I'd have to do it all over again. Uh, Commodore Wilkins, family and friends, welcome. I'm uh, Eugene Hodson, in case you haven't met. Uh, I'm his son. My sister Lynn is here, and her family, and my family. I would first of all ask for a It's not easy. 
I told everybody that I, I only cry at old yellow movies. I <laughs> family. Usually a pretty straight-laced guy. Anyway, I would first of all like to thank the Royal Canadian Navy and in particular the officers and crew of the HMCS Discovery and the Aid Band for providing such a special send-off for our dad. Also, the RCP Honor Guard is greatly appreciated, as is the Royal Canadian Navy Honor Guard, as my father has a special relationship with both the Force and the Royal Canadian Navy. Also, thank you to all the speakers for your kind remarks about our dad. Uh, they are very much appreciated. I've been basically, as in the last uh, half hour, everyone came up to me with stories, asked me to tell them. I did do my best. Uh, I'm not going to be. Uh, I will be a, a bit emotional, but there's there's a lot of funny things that these guys left on the table, so I've got a lot to work. With. Um, it's fitting that we're all gathered here at HMCS Discovery, where my dad began his training to go to war against his father's wishes. He, of course, being a Quaker, uh, but my mother, or my grandmother, was an Anglican, and she was all for it. So, off, off he went. <laughs> it changed him uh, from a boy to a man, and it launched him on his career, incredible public career. If this was uh, like one of my dad's community meetings in the Northwest Territories, he would have let everybody come up here and have a, have a say. And he'd be here, we'd be here till midnight. And he'd patiently listen to every single one of you talk about what you needed, what your concerns were, what your thoughts were about your family, and, and how many fire trucks you needed. And he'd get them for you. So I'm kind of glad that I'm the final speaker. I'm sure everyone else is too. <laughs> My sister and I won the adoption lottery. We were incredibly fortunate to have had Peru and Stu as our parents. And I'd now like to share just a few brief stories about uh, my dad over his, his time. When I was a little guy, uh, he used to take me to the union meetings and sawmills around the lower mainland. We didn't have cell phones to text and play video games, so I had to sit and listen to my dad's speeches. It was a particularly tense meeting on this particular afternoon. Bargaining wasn't going very well, and so I, I became the foil. I started whispering rather loudly from the front seat. And my dad bellowed, one Hodgson at a time. And it brought the house down, and off we went. We snuck out the back door. Those, those days back in the 50s and 60s were awfully incredible. Um, my dad was a very close friend of Tommy Douglas. He was one of the signatories to NDP. Um, so it was quite an all uh, lifetime elder member. He, he morphed into one out as he as he aged. But uh, he was Tommy Douglas's bodyguard. And one particular moment at, at the uh, when one of the big halls out in East Vancouver, Tommy was in fine form, making a great speech to the to the all assembled crowd. And my father was standing on his side, probably right where the officers were standing. Tommy Douglas, in his speech, wrote a note, passed it to my dad. My father looked at it <laughs> and said, some son of a bitch has got a stable gun that's stapling <laughs> the audience. <laughs> and my dad crumped up the paper, looked up the crowd, and sure enough, some guy had a staple gun and, and, and the tore it, pointed at Tommy, and, and it, would, it was painting off his chest and his ear and his Space, so, but it didn't hurt <coughs> Tommy at all. He kept kept going. So my father and one of his uh, associates walked down the side of the aisle, came across where the fellow was standing or sitting, and, and every time he stood up, he would, uh, he, he would, uh, he would uh, take a shot at my dad or at Tommy. So in came my father, asked the fellow sitting next to the uh, unsuspecting perpetrator to move off. He, Squirted him out the side, sat down to the next next time the guy stood up, my father grabbed his arm, broke it, dragged the guy out the back door, and that was we never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> my father was a very tough son of a gun. Uh, he was a shore patrol in Londonderry during World War II. He used to break up fights between the, the Brits and the Canadians in, in bars around Londonderry before they went to the war. He was uh, he was a tough guy. It was an amazing experience in the Northwest Territories when we moved there in 67. It was not uh, from a Vancouver boy to Ottawa to Yellowknife. It was 
2,600 people, 2,500 people there, small, very small town. But it wasn't exactly a normal childhood for us, unless maybe you're comparing us to Justin Trudeau. <laughs> he, he mentioned his trip to the North Pole at his father's uh, funeral and, and how he went to visit Santa Claus. And <clears throat> that was a trip that was secretly arranged by my father. He took uh, young Mr. Trudeau and, and his father uh, to the North Pole with the Twin Otter on uh, President Day, much to the chagrin of the RCMP and, and everybody else. It was, uh, it was a very hastily, but it was already pre-planned. They ended up in alert, which is where Santa happened to be. Uh, a regular member of the armed forces dressed up as Santa at any rate. It's a talk here. They're all going to have to forget as you walk out here. I'm not uh, going to get into too many, too many details as to how I put the skidoo through the basement window. <laughs> Except to say, <clears throat> never start a snowmobile in 40 below without making sure the throttle is unfrozen. <laughs> the skidoo took off and I was sitting on my bunk watching it turn into the window. It went right through the, the pane of glass as my sister and, her, and, and my father were watching television. And Skidoo came right over top of the television. It was a new thing called 3D uh, television. <laughs> anyway, my father came running out, suffice to say, and, and, and uh, he was happy that I wasn't hurt so he could kill me. <laughs> we, we traveled all over the north. It's uh, 72 communities. Uh, my sister and I, my sister got to go to Greenland on a, a great trip. Um, we went to the Arctic Winter Games in, in Anchorage, Alaska, where I, I uh, Jay Otis will tell a story, maybe later up in, over a drink, uh, about uh, introducing me to some, some Klondike girl. Anyway, it was fun. And the Yukon, well, we, we always looked as, as, as a sort of smaller brother than the little guy next door. And we had the same, we had a cheer in this part of the room, remember the, uh, the volleyball team and the cheerleaders that went over from the Arctic Winter Games. And it was Yukon, why, why not? And you, you can have it. Anyway, that was our week. It wasn't the best year, but it worked. So. My dad was known for his community meetings. It was uh, his way of transferring decision-making power to the local people and their communities. One meeting in particular was in the Belcher Islands, which uh, if you get a map out, you look at the southern, sort of in the midpoint of Hudson's Bay, and you move down to the south, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere, really. Anyway, we, he was there uh, at the south camp, uh, uh, having a meeting one night, and this, they didn't get many visitors, never mind any community meetings with the commissioner. So they, they wanted to drag this one out, this was, this was good. So at two in the morning, it finally ended. And many of these, community members got on their skidoos and, and dog sleds and went north to Santa Kilowatt, which was 70 miles north overnight. And of course, my father uh, had a meeting there the next day in the afternoon, and there they all were again, ready to start. He said, that was so much fun, sir. We want to keep going. <laughs> and that was, his, uh, that was his style. I used to go uh, driving with him almost uh, every night. My dad, we, taught me how to drive, he was a very good driver. And, uh, we'd stop and have a visit with different people uh, you know, almost every night. We, my father had a, a few close friends that uh, were a little off the wall a bit. Uh, his pilot, his private, his, his, his pilot was uh, Daryl Brown. There's a flight at the time that's here in the audience today. It's actually fitting to hear all those uh, airplanes take off and land. Those are the planes that we used to fly around the north of the, the Twin Otter and the, and the Turbo, Turbo Beaver. But, but we'd stop and, and have a, a drink with Daryl and, and David Searle, and, who lived across the street and up the block. And a guy named Councillor Pete Baker, uh, Mr. Parker and David Searle will remember him. Anyone who was, who's, who was in the 60s, uh, Mr. Baker was one of the first elected councillors in the Northwest Territories for the Element. He lived in Old Town and he was a prospector. And he was Lebanese, I think. And, and he lived in the old town, but boy, whew, this was not the nicest place to, to go visit. But every, every other day we'd go down, or every week or so we'd go down and walk into, into his cabin, 40 below, and he would welcome us. He'd 
take out a glass, spit in it, and take his rag and, and wipe it and pour some whiskey for us. <laughs> <laughs> the whiskey killed whatever I hope they were. Anyway, I learned, learned how to drive in, in, in very <laughs> slippery conditions. We, we go from Pete's, we, we head out to Dada, da which is an Indian village about, about 20 minutes uh, drive on the ice road. And the ice road was, you had to be careful. And, and of course, driving at night at high speed, you, you would have bridges and ice ridges. And in fact, you'd have open ice from time to time, which uh, we would hopefully avoid. And, and, I know people that didn't avoid them and, and ended up in the, in the Great Slave Lake, and that's where they're still at. So, um, you know, driving at night um, and, and on an open road like that, it certainly made you pay attention. So I learned my ice driving skills uh, the hard way. My dad was meticulous, and as Rob uh, Whitson mentioned, if the flags were wrapped around the pole on the top of the air flag building, he would go all up there himself and unwrap them. Didn't always have Rob to, to, to hold on to, so he had me, or I would hold on to him. And he'd unwrap it, and that was one of the scariest things I've ever had. Uh, six, on the sixth floor on the roof, and, and it was night, it was dark, it was cold, but he wanted those flags flopping in the breeze, so that was his thing. Uh, I gotta say, he, uh, he also made sure the snow was removed uh, up and down our street. He had a snow bar, which David Searle will remember, and, and, and Christy. The neighbors initially wondered who the hell this guy was. What's, what's he doing? He's going up and down the street every time there was a snowfall with a snowblower. That's the way he was. He, he, he snowplowed every single walkway, all the driveways. He, he, I guess he liked to snowplow, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> he really enjoyed it. You know, it was like when the, when the power went out in Yellowknife for, for about five, six hours in the middle of winter. And we had this APU and we turned it on, but it it never really kicked in. It was 40 below. We started to freeze, and we were starting to worry that uh, the power was never going to come back on, and we had, we're going to have to evacuate the town. But he, he took charge. There were a lot of those types of stories that, uh, you know, growing up it was quite quite the experience. Um, I'll tell you one more. In January. The Ward Air Twin Otter was, was flying back with my dad and some staff particularly. Uh, there was a reporter on board. Anyway, the, the pilots uh, misjudged uh, the, the winds and got about halfway to Yellowknife and ran out of gas. And this was in the middle of January, and, and so they had to set the aircraft down in the middle of the lake, and it was dark. Luckily, there was a moon. There was moon lit, so we landed, and Ward Air flew out the that night and picked them up and brought them home. It was on the front page of the Edmonton Journal and across the country the next morning. The commissioner had gone down over the, over the Arctic and this Edmonton Journal reporter created all sorts of, of uh, hoopla. And Max Ward uh, was apologetic with my own belief, I understand. I don't know what happened to the pilot and maybe flying with Air Canada now or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you went to Gimli or Gimli or something. <laughs> but uh, those were the risks. And, and, and they were, although, you know, you probably don't understand what it's like working in that environment. It's, it was a very harsh, very dangerous, and not always easy to, to operate in. But he operated with skill. He, he was not, not afraid. I, uh, one of my proudest moments was when I got my university degree in 1978. He gave the commencement speech. He got the doctor degree. I got the bachelor degree. <laughs> but I was very proud. It was, a, it was a very special moment. And then he went to uh, after the north. He went to Ottawa. There was a, I guess, no one from the IJC here today, but uh, someone asked me to tell the story, so I will. Um, he was uh, fairly new, a couple of months in, and, and the other chairman of the United States was not a very nice person. He, uh, he was a bully, and I guess he'd always gotten his way with previous chairs from Canada, and they were all pushovers. So there were 21 uh, issues and matters that uh, were unresolved and when he became the, uh, the uh, chairman of Canada. One day, the chairman of the United States was berating his staff about something, 
my father very impatiently, as, uh, as uh, Cindy Rosen would say about his, his relationships with his staff, that he uh, reached over, grabbed the guy, you know, this is an international joint commission, this is like US and Canada relationships, this is how my father negotiated. <laughs> he reached over, brought the guy over and said, no, either we're going to shut the hell up, or we're going to go outside and get this sorted out together. And the guy said, are you kidding? He said, no, do I look like I'm kidding? <laughs> and he said, so he sat down, he shut up, and he never said a word, and he left. Two weeks later, he retired. <laughs> he was a bully, and, and of course, two years later, all 21 of those issues were resolved. And of course, I, I, I'll tell you that he did. My dad did get called on the carpet. Uh, the Prime Minister Gordon Roberts, the Prime Council Chairman, called him in and said, "You know, you're not supposed to do that. This is, you know, high high stake uh, relationships between Canada and the United States." And he said, "Well, I'm sorry, sir." He said, "So did you really scare the shit out of him?" <laughs> he said, "Oh, I think so, sir." He said, "Okay, well, carry on." And that was he was, he was unique. And, so obviously when he went to, to Ferries uh, uh, with Jess Ketchum and, and, and uh, joined that uh, esteemed organization, that he, my dad really loved the IJC. He got to go to New York and Washington and, and uh, he enjoyed the opera. He, he loved life, he loved those big cities. But uh, going home to Victoria to or Vancouver and, and British Columbia to help resolve a, what was a a flailing fleet uh, and turn it around like he did uh, it was quite an amazing. Another career, and, and then of course doing the same thing with BC Transit and building, and making sure SkyTrain was was there and operational for for the uh, for the expo. There's of course the famous photo of him escorting Prince Charles, his great friend, on board the newly christened first train of the SkyTrain fleet, and uh, he also oversaw the. the Construction of, of, of numerous ferries while he was, was chairman as well. So he created a everywhere he went. He, he didn't like uh, he didn't have a hobby. He didn't golf. He worked. That's what he did. My wife Karen told me that uh, she kept dating me after meeting my parents <laughs> on, on only our second date, of course. I knew I knew I, I had a good thing going. My parents is a foil, so if I, uh, if I like a girl, that's I usually introduce it to my parents fairly quick. And she, but Karen was uh, Karen. I brought, I brought her then. She said uh, she probably stuck with me because she was delighted to see that romantic spark between my parents. Karen was kind of hopeful that that might rub off on me a bit. But <laughs> my sons were born after my dad had retired, so I didn't really see him. Uh, like many of you did in his prime. They enjoyed their trips with him, their time, and Sarah so eloquently spoken of it. Carrying around for hours and hours, uh, keeping, uh, keeping, letting the, the, the mothers have a, have a bit of a sleep, uh, and Karen, and, and I'm sure Lynn. I, I just, uh, I remember taking both my sons on separate occasions to Yellowknife with my father, uh, one in particular, the Arctic Winter Games, when we took young Evan here, who was, uh, who was uh, quite, quite uh, a lot shorter and younger than he is now. And we went to the, uh, uh, checked in at the Explorer Hotel, and, and, uh, and there was Rick Mercer, and, and Evan was quite enamored. This was, we watched Rick uh, on TV, everything. and so Rick and, uh, gave an autograph and handshake. And, and, we went to the uh, opening ceremonies of the Arctic Winter Games, and my father, uh, he, was, he was elderly at that time, Stephen Harper was making a big speech to, to announce the opening. We were in the back room, and, 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 off the, and, and then my dad had his park on. We walked up, this, up the stairs, and I was scared that uh, the torch he was going to light us all on fire. I honestly thought this torch was going to blow, and, and his arm was going to get caught, and have a bit of an issue. So, when we got, as we were coming up the stairs, I turned to Evan and I said, just tell him to just point to the, to the, uh, to the torch. And, and the young gentleman uh, lit the torch and, and everything worked out fine. So we didn't have any, any catastrophes at the Arctic Winter Games in front of 5,000 people. That was, that was not, not a good thing. We got back to the hotel and there was RCMP in front of the restaurant. We were a bit hungry. So my, my son and I, uh, I walked up 
the RCMP stood attention and they said, you're welcome in here, sir. And in we went. Only two people, two tables occupied. One was the Prime Minister and the other was Rick Mercer and, and Evan went right over to Rick. We had a photo later. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister wanted to photo with the family, but I know, I know it's even his heart. It was Rick that really was the attraction at that particular moment. Um, we hope to be able to go back to the North uh, many times. Obviously, I stewart uh, Stu too. Um, was named after my dad, so so there will always be a, a, a connection with you. Anyway, thank you to all my father's friends and caregivers who visited him with visited him over the years and, and spent many hours listening to his him reminisce about his life, especially these past years as, as his memory faded. Even he always had that infectious laugh, though. And, he always wanted to kiss the ladies' hands, as you know. So I, I have to tell you that I want to apologize to all the ladies that, whose hands he kissed, because I know it was awkward sometimes when he would say that he was an Austrian knight, which gave him license to do it, but in fact, <laughs> I, I, I can't really find anything that said he was a knight in Austria. <laughs> so, but in fact, he was a Danish knight. So I'm not sure that he was actually allowed to kiss the ladies' hands under the Danish rules, but he did it anyway. And he and Victor Borga were the only two recipients of the Order of Denmark, Denmark in North America. So I guess we'll never really know. Um, by the way, they've asked, they've asked for that medal back. I can't find it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Thanks again to uh, everyone for traveling from across the country to be here today to honor father, our grandfather, and our great-grandfather, our boss, our friend, our, our colleague. He was one of a kind, and they definitely threw away the mold. Uh, but we will always have our special memories of him, and uh, I know each one of you will have one that's unique to you, personally. Hope he's having a rum and coke by a pool with my mom up there somewhere, looking down on all of us and saying, oh, that's first class. I'd invite the Remembrances Party to uh, retake your seats and uh, we'll have a picnic this time.